have a couple of questions so I can kind of preach with a clear conscience this morning. Um, my brain is, is right. Uh, I just have some things I need to take care of. Anybody in here struggle with obedience, the idea of obedience, okay? Those of you that struggle with obedience and you watch the first service, anybody that watched the first service? Okay, so I've got my three suspects right there. Um, I always go in at, between services to brush my teeth. My toothbrush is sitting in my top drawer, my middle drawer, and um, my toothpaste is always sitting right there beside it. I reached in this morning to grab my toothpaste out, and I noticed something, thankfully. Somebody had taken my toothpaste out and put in polybond. Um, yeah. So which one of the three of y'all did it? Because I know that y'all snuck in after that and said, I want to hear that sermon again. And uh, no, I've got some suspects. I've got some folks that I'm watching. And I know this is going out and we're live, but that's okay. Those of you that are home, if you snuck in and did it, I'll find out. But uh, yeah, so that's good. That's good. But don't worry. Toddle, I'll figure out if it was you or not. So I know you use that stuff, so you probably just placed it in there. Um, I am one of those who struggles with obedience. I always have. It is something that I have struggled with since I was a child. It is something that is hard. Obedience. I'm pretty good sometimes starting out on the right track, but then trying to do things my own way. Anybody else guilty of trying to do things? You, you kind of get on the right track, things are going good, and then maybe you get comfortable or maybe you just get tired of the idea of obedience and you start out on your own and kind of veer, veer left and, and not where you need to go. Obedience is tough, but obedience is necessary. <clears throat> obedience is necessary. So let's look at this this morning. Let's stand as we read a call to obey, Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 through 18. Now, Joshua is going to be speaking to the whole congregation, and then at the end of the reading, he'll be speaking to a particular group of God's people. He says, only be strong, verse 7, and courageous, very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand. Are to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourself, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And to the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke. So this is a particular group out of all of these that he's speaking to. Saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren, armed all your mighty men of valor, and help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you. And they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. So they answered Joshua, saying, all that you uh, commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you, as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Father, we pray this morning that you would take our hearts of disobedience. And Lord God, that you would convict us of such hearts and that, Father, we would desire this morning to trade those in for righteousness and obedience and following after you with all of our heart. 
Lord, may we see the importance of obedience through this message today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Obedience is something, I, as I said, that I have struggled with throughout my life. I shared this morning a story about when my, I did not do what my father had told me to do during the day, that he had us out at night with a flashlight. And we were disking up, or we were uh, tilling up the, between the rows. And, and after about two or three times, I had chopped some plants off. My brother finally looked at me and said, let me till. You pull everything back. Because I was horrible. I, I cannot till worth a flip. Um, I'm not one of those that can do anything straight. Uh, it's going to kind of be crooked as it goes. But my brother was, was caused to be outside due to me, due to my inability to obey my father and what he had told us to do. And what it took me a long time to learn as a child, I have learned as an adult, and unfortunately, I haven't learned from it all the time, but my disobedience impacts every single person around me. When I'm disobedient, everybody has the effect of that. Everybody gets affected by it because that is how it works. If I'm disobedient, now I'm out of line, and either I cause others to follow me or I cause others to have to deal with with the pain of disobedience. But I often found my mother to be sweeter when I was obedient. Not so sweet when I was disobedient. Well, that wasn't my mom's fault. That was due to what? That was due to my disobedience. And had I been able to put that together a little bit sooner, I would have learned that obedience led to a much happier childhood and not such a sore backside. And I had plenty of those. And there were times that I just went ahead and turned myself in because I knew that I was going to get found out anyway. And yes, I would get in trouble. I would usually get a good spanking on that. But then I would still have to go back and do what was right. I had to go back and fix it. I had to go back and correct it. We have a call to obey. But in our world today, obedience is hated. We do not like obedience. We, we do not celebrate obedience. 25 years ago or so when I did my first wedding Nervous and scared, pastor, a friend of mine handed me a book, Dr. Ira Bright handed me a book. I, I called him and said, I need to know what to do. And he said, I, I come by the office. He said, better than that, I'll come by your office. And he brings me this book. And it was just a, a, a thing for preachers. It was just this book that we, things we had to do. Funerals and weddings, business meetings, all types of stuff. But as I looked in there for the weddings, it, it, it amazed me at the words that were put there for a wedding. And the importance of those words. And 25 years ago, it was a non-issue when you would look at the wife and you would say to trust or to honor, to trust and obey, right? A lady would look at that and she'd, that, that's my part. That's my part. Nowadays, like in my daughter's wedding, when she looked and she said, obey, kind of like, what? what? She knew it was coming. She knew it was there. But you fast forward to today, and, and I have a lot of people who tell me, I will not use that word whatsoever. And I basically explain to them other words that I could use. And then they decide obey is not so bad. But why do I have to obey? And then you take it back through Scripture, and you take these ladies to Ephesians, and the husband's sitting there going, that's right, woman, you are supposed to obey. <laughs> and a man's like, you know, honey, if you would just do the biblical part of obeying me, everything would be better. The problem is, is that the man doesn't think he has to obey, and yet God addresses you first. And we're supposed to love the wife as Christ loved the church and laid his life down for it. My question is, are we worthy of following? Are we worthy of obeying? You say, well, my husband's not, so I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. Because the Bible does, didn't, God didn't come to you and go, now, if you want to obey your husband, go ahead and do that. But if not, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. No, the Bible is very clear. You are to be obedient to the leadership of your husband. But men, if you aren't leading, 
Don't get mad at your wife if she's following after you. We're to be obedient. Children, obey your parents. Yeah, but, but their rules are stupid. Guess what? Rules are stupid your whole life. That's why God said obey your parents. Get used to it now so it doesn't hurt as bad later when you grow up. Just the truth. Learn to obey. Learn to be obedient. You don't get to ask why. I, I, it amazes me how many kids I'll hear parents in a conversation with their children, and the kid will go, well, tell me why. Let me tell you what would have happened to me had I told my mother, tell me why. And I know that some of y'all think my mama was mean. My mother had to survive two boys, okay, who drove her crazy, mainly my brother. But I, I'm here to tell you, if I had looked at my mother and I'd want her to explain to me why, the next thing I knew, I was having to figure out, how did I get here? <laughs> On the floor, and now I got to get back up. Because how dare me question the authority of my parent, my job was to obey. When I went to school, if I didn't like how the classroom was ran, my mother didn't call the school. My mother told me to suck it up, buttercup. That's the law. That's the way it is. Those are the rules. Figure it out. Obey. That's all you're there for. But they're hard. You know what I found out in seventh grade? If you don't turn your homework in, even if you do your homework, and you don't turn your homework in. It's all in your locker. Guess what they make you do in seventh grade? They make you repeat it. Yeah, Y'all go ahead and laugh. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. My mother went into the end of the, end of the year and we were cleaning out my locker. And she just starts unraveling all the homework that I never turned in and got zeros on. Nowadays, if a kid gets a zero, the parent calls, well, it's really not their fault. Yeah, it is. Obedience, folks. We don't like the word because if we, if we actually obey, we have to do something that we may not like. But yet when we obey, listen to me, obedience leads to blessing. I knew it led to less whippings, which was a blessing for a kid growing up. Obedience. Doesn't matter if you like the rules or if you don't like the rules. Obeying is part of being a Christian. That's what God called us to do. So you say, what is all this about? Well, let's look at this. Let's look in Joshua here and let's see. Receiving the promise was contingent on one important thing obedience. Let's look at verse 7 and 8 again. It says here, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. The first thing in order for them to prosper, what did they have to do? They had to be obedient to all that Moses had commanded them. Everything that Moses had taught them, they had to be obedient to. And if they were obedient, they would prosper. Verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. All right? Notice that key word there is all. All. Anybody in here ever had half-hearted obedience? Right? Half-hearted. You know, y'all know what half-hearted obedience is, right? Full-blown disobedience. Half-hearted obedience is full-blown disobedience. And disobedience does not bring us prospering. It does not bring us peace. It does not bring us comfort. It does not bring us hope. The Lord himself here tied obedience to success. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. But not until you learn to be obedient, not until you do what I've told you to do. These things are not coming unless this happens. Obedience. We like to reap the rewards of obedience, but not actually be obedient. Well, according to scripture, that's not how it works. We, uh, God himself, tied obedience to our success. How many of you have found that when you follow the rules, you don't question the rules, you just follow the rules, how much smoother your life goes? You ever met somebody that worked, or well, they really didn't work, they had a job, they really didn't do much, but they expected a raise? Are people that didn't work hard and they wonder why they got fired? When 
when we don't obey, when we don't do what we're called to do, when we only do it halfway, we don't have the things that God has told us we could have. If you want those things, you've got to apply obedience to your life. I want success, okay? Then be obedient. I want things to prosper, okay? Then be obedient. Do I have to be obedient to everything? What does the scripture teach us? Absolutely, all things. That word is important. That word is so, so very important. As Joshua is having this conversation, he is telling the people to get ready. They're about to go and do something. So verse 10, let's skip down to verse 10. It says, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, pass through the camp and command the people saying, prepare provisions for yourself for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Here's their leader. He is saying, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out, send everybody out and you're going to tell everybody to get ready because in three days we're going over. Anybody in here a procrastinator? Just raise your hand if you're a procrastinator. You're not, a, not at all? She is, though, huh? So you'll tell me later? Yeah, I said in the first service, those of you that are, that are wondering if you should raise your hand, that would be you, okay? Um, yeah, so here's reality. I mean, we, we, have this, we have this problem with procrastination. Let's imagine that, that, that Joshua says, all right, here's what we're going to do. We want you to go out and tell everybody. But then you had those people that are going, well, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. When we're not immediately obedient, it sets everybody else up for failure. Y'all agree with that? When we're not immediately obedient, we set everybody else up for failure. If these people would not have been obedient to listen to Joshua and to do their job, the people would have not have been prepared to get across. You want to know how your life affects everybody else's and why your life is so important to get it right because what your decision is will affect every single person around you. It's the way it works. He's telling them to get ready. But what if they didn't want to take the lamb? What if they just sat there and, well, we'll just wait here for God to give it to us? They had to cross over, didn't they? They had to go and possess it. They had to go and take it. But there are a lot of people that I know that just sit around going, okay, God, I want you to bless me. I'm going to sit here and wait on it. I, I, I've got news for you. Your blessing's probably not coming anytime soon. You got to put foot to your prayer. Foot to your faith. Get up and go. Get up and do something. If God has told you to take it, get up and take it. If God has told you to do something, get up and be obedient. If you want the blessing and the prosperity that God can bring into your life, then get up and do something. Be obedient to what God has called you to do. If you want a happy family, then be a good father. If you want a happy family, then be an obedient mother. If you want a happy family, then obey your parents. Obedience is all the way across. If you're miserable at school because your teacher is hard, get over it. Because one day you're going to work for somebody who you don't like, but you like that paycheck. And you're going to have to suck it up, buttercup, and be obedient. God has called us to obedience. But there are a lot of people who look at this and go, everybody else is doing it. I'll just sit here and reap the reward. No, no. If you don't do your part, others will suffer. When it came time for us to do the revival here at our church, we were going to do the countywide revival. There were, I just knew we were going to run into issues. Man, this church was ready to go. Leadership, was they were on board, ready to go. Let's do this thing. It blessed my heart to see the excitement. Now, this church, we paid a lot of money towards that, a whole lot of money. But I was so thankful whenever John at First Baptist got on board with us and said, Tom, I want to be a part of it. And then some other churches got on board. Some gave, you know, $10, some gave 50, some gave 100. One church gave 1,000 um, outside of what our church and First Baptist had given. It was a blessing to see everything kind of start coming together. But we knew we needed to do this. And there were more churches that chose not to participate than there were churches that did participate. However, I will tell you that those that participated got a huge blessing out of that week. We met people we'd have never met. There were folks who didn't even know that they went, the other people went to church. And now y'all have begun to build relationships outside of our church 
with people that don't look like you. You don't hang in the same circle of friends, but now you understand you have a kinship in Jesus Christ. But it took somebody being obedient. Do you know how hard it was for me to be obedient to that? Because I know the history of this area. And I know that especially white and black churches do not do a lot together. But I know God said, that's enough. And this church got behind your pastor, and I'm going to tell you that was one of my greatest days as your pastor, was watching that week unfold. But it took obedience. It took all of us saying, yes, this is what God's calling us to do. What do we got to get it, do to get it done? And there were people that worked tirelessly. They constantly were at it. I mean, I'm telling you, it amazed me to watch people step up and just get things done. But you have to be obedient. Mike, when you headed across and you came home and told your wife that y'all were, y'all were going to be doing an orphanage and your wife said, that's good for you. That's kind of how that conversation went at first, right? <laughs> but then God changed what? Your heart completely. And now you're bought in. But it took one act of obedience to start a huge ministry thousands of miles away in another country. And now there are children who know the Lord, who would not have known had it not been for one act of obedience. So the people are on board. Joshua says, let's get ready. Get everybody moving. Let's go. But then there was that other group. Let's read about this other group, and I'm going to Try to tie it all in so it'll make sense for you. Verse 12 says, And to the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. So what do we find? That part of God's people are not going to cross over, Right? He says, this, this group of people, you are staying on the other side of the Jordan. You're going to get to do this. This is what Moses promised you. This is the word that Moses gave you. You are herdsmen. You, you guys raise cattle and sheep, and the, the land here is great for that. We're going to give this to you. That is correct. This is your place. But listen to what else he says. But you shall pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor, and help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you. And they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. You say, well, Brother Tom, I don't understand what he's talking about. Well, I want, I want you to understand. If you would turn to uh, Numbers chapter 32. Numbers chapter 32. Just go left. Go, go, go back and kind of go back towards the beginning of the, towards Genesis and you'll find Numbers. Page 193. Page 193. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. <laughs> Not sure where it's at in your Bible, but it'll be somewhere in that, in that vicinity probably. Numbers 32, we read uh, some beautiful, beautiful words. It's a picture of the children coming together. God is ready to give some of them their land. Moses isn't real happy about it, by the way. Let's read this, but what Moses is going to say at the end is absolutely awesome. It's awesome. I want you to hear what he says at the end, but we're going to read this together. It says, Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Jazir and the land of Gilead, that indeed the region was a place for livestock, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came to and spoke to Moses, to Eleazar the priest, and to the leaders of the congregation. Now, let's skip down here to verse number four. It says, The country which the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock. 
and your servants have livestock. Therefore, they said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us over the Jordan. So what? Let's get this straight. God has promised the people, the children of Israel, that this is their land over here across the Jordan. As far as they can see, it's theirs. Now, this particular group says, hey, we're happy. We don't have to go over there. That's more land for everybody else. We're happy right here. And Moses, as a great leader, loses his temper <laughs> and doesn't let them finish. Y'all ever, ever work for somebody that didn't let you tell them the rest of the story? Your husband, okay, so poor HC, she just threw you under the bus, buddy. And, and so we have these folks that aren't quite ready to listen, and, and they just, they hear something, and it just sets them off. And so and Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? Now, why will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord has given them? Did they say any of that? All they asked was what? If it's good with you, if things are okay. And it says in verse 8, Thus your fathers did when I sent them away from Kadesh Barnea to, send, uh, to see the land. For when they went up to the valley of Eshkol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel so that they did not go into the land which the Lord uh, had given them. So the Lord's anger was, ar excuse me, was aroused on that day. And he swore an oath saying, Surely none of the men who came up from Egypt from 20 years old and above shall see the land of which I swore to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob because they have not wholly followed me. Again, how are we supposed to follow God's obedience? Wholly, completely. Except Caleb, the son of Jephna, the Kinsonite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. Again, those who completely did the obedience thing, not half-hearted obedience, but complete obedience, they're getting to go in and see the land. So the Lord's anger, verse 13, was aroused against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. So everybody except for two men are ready to cross over. The rest of them have died. And verse 14 says, and look, you have risen in your father's place, a brood of sinful men to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will once again leave them in the wilderness and you will destroy all these people. Now, what Moses said there is very true. If they were going to be disobedient, they were going to destroy all the people. Verse 16 says, then they came near to him. Can you imagine somebody being this angry? But they knew what there was in their heart. And so they came near to him and said, we will build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones. But we ourselves will be armed, ready to go before the children of Israel until we have brought them to their place. And our little ones will dwell in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until every one of the children of Israel has received his inheritance. For we will not inherit with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond because our inheritance has fallen to us on this eastern side of the Jordan. Then Moses said to them, if you do this thing, if you arm yourselves before the Lord of the, uh, for war and all your armed men cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies uh, from before him and the land is subdued before the Lord, then afterward you may return and be blameless before the Lord and before Israel. And this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if you do not do so... Then take note, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will what? Find you out. Build cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep, and do what has proceeded out of your mouth. Anybody in here ever struggle keeping their own word? Making promises and not keeping those promises? They're about to be called out on their promise. They're about to be called out on their promise. What do they say? We will go before Israel. We will, we will head up the battle. We will be in the first in line because we're the first to take possession of our own land. So let's go back here and let's look at the, in Joshua and let me, let's see how Joshua talks to them. Verse 13 says, remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren, armed all your mighty men of valor, and help them. 
They were to be at the front. That was the word they gave. Now, Joshua is saying, do you remember your word? Are you ready to keep your word? Some of you in here, you're struggling in your marriage. Let me ask you a question. Are you good to keep your word? Are you going to fight to keep your word? Some of you in here that want to be, you want to be a better student, a better child, a better, a better kid for your parents. Then be obedient. Keep your word. In verse 16, I love it. Look what verse 16 says. So they answered Joshua saying, all that you command us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. But listen to what they say next. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words and all that you command him shall be put to death. Do you think obedience is important to God? These people said, if anyone disobeys even the word of Joshua, let him be put to death. He says, and all that you command him shall be put to death, only be strong and of good courage. You want to fix what's broken in your life? Come back to obedience. Come back to obedience. Some things are not going to be fixable in your life. But let me tell you something. When God starts putting you back together, what needs to be there will be there. Sometimes things fall apart. That doesn't mean you're finished. It doesn't mean you're through. There's just going to be a new chapter written. But in this new chapter, find yourself in the middle of obedience. And finally, let's look at this. When God's people unite in obedience, they can rest assured that God will bless them in wonderful ways. Moms and dads, if you're having a tough time with your kiddos, you both come together in obedience. Teachers, if you're having a rough time at school, make sure your children see you being obedient. Leadership of this church, what is God calling us to next? Where is he taking us next? Let us be obedient to that. Because the only way for peace, the only way for prosperity, the only way for God's will to be done fully in this church is if we as a body find ourselves in the middle of obedience. The only road to happiness the only road to happiness is found in obedience. Remember God disciplines those he loves. I don't want to have to give God more discipline than he already has. How do I change that? I become obedient to his word. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace, and we thank you, Father, that you have called us to such a place of obedience right here at Pine Island. Why are we here? What's the purpose? Why did God bring us here? Well, it was to grow us. It was to challenge us. It was to change us. And I pray, Father, that's exactly what will happen with all of us that are here. Whether you've been here this is your first time today or you've been here for your whole life. God, we want to be an obedient people. So, Father, may we know your word. May we read it. May we not turn left or right from it. God, may we stay straight into your word and follow all that you've commanded us. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all good things. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.